morning, everyone. Good morning. Have the uh, <coughs> privilege of taking a turn at uh, bringing the message this morning, and so uh, <coughs> it's just a, it's an honor to stand before you. And so we're going to get right into it. Uh, <coughs> what I'd like to talk with you about a little bit uh, this morning is uh, identity. And I want to uh, take a look at uh, just a couple of things about <clears throat> identity, where it comes from, uh, who tells us who we are, uh, those kind of things that we oftentimes take for granted. We just kind of come into consciousness at some point in our life and uh, start, you know, hit the ground running. And we don't really think about too much the identity part of it and where, where that comes from and and wh- how, what God's design is for that, and, uh, and then kind of letting Him uh, be uh, the gauge of our experience with, with coming into who, how do we identify. And, uh, and so I want to talk to you about that, but uh, in kind of preliminary to that, uh, as Paul addressed the Romans in the first chapter of Romans as you know, the, the kind of what I look at as being like one of these big slides at the carnival, right? Where it, it, you start sliding down and you're going faster and you're just going, you're going down toward, toward the end, which is a lot of fun. Paul kind of describes that in a spiritual standpoint, which is not fun uh, in Romans chapter 1. Uh, and that is that as, as a people, as a race of people, uh, humanity left to our own nature slides away from God and just gets gradually worse and worse uh, without God's intervention. And uh, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 25, make, Paul makes the observation that they exchanged the truth of God for the lie. And he puts the, the article on the lie, like not just a lie, but the lie. So the truth versus the lie and um, what it's, the idea is, is reality, what's real, for what is the deception. And a deception isn't just something that isn't true. A deception is, it's calculated to be false. It's something that there's an agenda behind the deception. And so Paul makes the, the point, just in talking about humanity in general, that there came a time <clears throat> where Humanity exchanged something. We, we made a trade. We traded reality for a calculated deception. And so I want to talk about that concept a little bit as it relates to uh, our identity and um, where our identity comes from and what the design is. Uh, uh, A.W. Tozer <coughs> tells a story, uh, and I don't know if it was something I read in one of his books or a, a sermon that I heard of his, but he tells a story that's very illustrative of the situation. He tells the story of a musician who is visiting a, a city with a symphony orchestra, and they're in town, uh, several engagements in that city. And after one of the engagements, uh, after one of their concerts, uh, in between the concert hall and the hotel, he gets mugged and robbed and, and left unconscious in an alley. And sometime in the morning, he wakes up in this alley, and he's been robbed. He has no identification on him, and he has amnesia, has no idea who he is. He just kind of comes to himself in this alley, obviously very vulnerable position. He's injured, and so he begins just kind of wandering around randomly, hoping that he'll run into somebody who recognizes him, somebody who can fill him in on on who he is and what's going on. So we can can kind of sense how vulnerable he must have felt. And and, and as he begins this search for information, he is recognized by one of his fellow musicians uh, from the symphony. And so that that person fills him in on, on who he is, on what they're doing there, on where he's from, and, and, and brings him into a place of safety to where he can get some medical help, and hopefully his memory will recover once he gets the help. But he brings him to a safe place where he can really realize the truth of who he is, right? And so <clears throat> that really illustrates 
humanity in a sense. So I just want us to think about just humanity in general for a minute. We've been mugged. Uh, we can read about that mugging in Genesis 3. Uh, we've been mugged, we've been uh, left uh, wounded, and we have a, a sense of spiritual amnesia. And like I said, we, our experience in life is we just kind of come to ourselves, and we don't really have a concept of, of who we are. But I think, it, you know, it, we're, obviously we're, we're learning that from our parents and from the people in our life, and it's not a, a conscience thing like it was in this story where we just all of a sudden go, whoa, who are we? Uh, but in a sense, we do that. In a sense, we are kind of, well, we're designed to receive our identity from the Father of our spirits. We have a Father who created our spirit, and, and by His design, that's where we are to get our identity of who we are, of what it's about, of, of, of who we are to Him, and, and to understand who we really are and who we belong to, who, who owns us, who, who do we attribute this to? If you're driving a car and you get pulled over and the uh, police officer asks you for some kind of proof of registration and ownership, and you just go, hey, I'm driving this car, so it's mine. That's not going to fly. But that's what we do with our life. We say, hey, I've come to, I kind of woke up and I'm driving this machine and it's mine, and I've got these rights, and I don't have to check in with anybody to find out who it really belongs to. <laughs> See, and, and so there, in a sense, that's our life experience, but it's so common that we just figure that's, that's truth, that's reality, but it's not reality. That's part of the deception. And so as we are seeking our identity from the world around us, the world system is very calculated and very purposefully put together by God's enemy to be to sell us the deception so we come up with all kinds of crazy things like if you were to just go out and, and, and I'm not going to get all political or anything but I'm just going to say if you were to just go out in today's culture and ask people how do you identify you would actually see some pretty crazy theories come out when we're looking at it through God's biblical worldview from God's standpoint of who people are and what people are designed to be. And so as I want to uh, explore this a little bit with the time we have this morning, <clears throat> we are sold the lie and we exchange the truth of God for the lie. And here's kind of what the lie looks like a little bit in Ephesians chapter 4. And some, most of what I'm going to be talking about this morning is from the book of Ephesians. That's where we've been spending a lot of time in our adult class, and I've been thinking a lot about uh, these scriptures. But in Ephesians chapter 4, <clears throat> like verse 17 through 19, he talks about the way that the, the people who don't know God, he calls them here the Gentiles, the rest of the Gentiles in that context. But listen, here's what the lie looks like. Here's what it looks like when we... Uh, exchange the truth when we exchange reality for a lie when we're sold a lie about our identity here's what it looks like futility darkened alienated ignorance blindness past feeling given over to lewdness and the work of uncleanness with greediness we're self-serving we if it feels good do it you know that was the slogan from our, for my generation you know the tie-dye slogan hey if it feels good do it you know i mean that that's you know that was that's the lie that's the deception when we meet jesus See, now in the, in, the, in the illustration, we meet Jesus. We meet the guy who can tell us who we really are. We meet the guy that can fill us in. When we meet Jesus, he tells us the truth. He gives us our true identity, which is the way that this chapter continues a little bit. In verse 20, it says, talking about the, the lie, the deception... He says in verse 20 of Ephesians 4, But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard Him and have been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus. The reality of the situation is in Jesus. We've met the person who can tell us the truth about ourselves. And we're learning Him. We're learning from Him. 
And what we're learning from him is that we put off concerning our former conduct, the old man, the old person, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, according to the deception, according to the lie, according. Jay was just up here, and, and <clears throat> to get the song right, he has a, a pitch pipe on his phone, and so he hits the right note, and then we accord, right? We all sing in the same key, except for me. <clears throat> now, I'm singing kind of half a step off from everybody else, but you guys who know how to accord, it, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a harmony that happens within. Like when we just did this last uh, song, uh, Love, <laughs> the, 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 the love of God. I can't even remember what that song's called now, but the one that phases in, right? Love one another for love is of God. Then the next part comes in. And as the parts come in, it goes just like expands and you hear all four parts come in and it just sounds full that's what according looks like so when Paul says here that when we learn Jesus we learn that we put off the old man who is according the old man is is getting in harmony with all these things that are part of the deception we accord with that and that's who we become. That's who we are. That's who we are becoming. It's an ongoing. We're becoming something. We're becoming more in accordance with the flesh, with the, the deception. But then we meet Jesus and we learn Jesus. And Jesus teaches us the reality of who we are because the truth is in Jesus. And we put on the new man. Now listen what the new man was created according to God. Oh, so now we're according with something else. We're according with someone else. We're according with different attributes. And I want to just spend some time, just a little bit of time right here, saying <clears throat> this is a classic question, right? And I'm sure it's been in a lot of movies and songs and everything because it just naturally lends itself to that. And that is that if Jesus, if Jesus is the reality who, com who comes to us and, and we're wandering around searching, who are we? Who are we? What does this group want to tell me that I am? What does this group want to, who are we? What does status look like? How much money do I have? What kind of car do I drive? What kind of clothes do I wear? How do I identify? What pronouns do I use? All the stuff that, that, that we're being sold in the world. Jesus comes and says, let me tell you who you are. Are we going to listen? To the one who created us, when he says, I am the truth, I am the reality, and I'm going to tell you the reality of who you are? Who are we, really? Right? That's the, that's the, the phrase. I know that phrase had to have been used a million times, right? Because it, it lends itself to that. Who are you, really? Right? It could be used in a comedy. It could be used in, in a romance movie it could be used who are you really really when it comes down to really reality who are you well here's what jesus says and this, these are highlights or excerpts taken from the first few chapters of ephesians i'm going to just blow through i'm going to speak the truth in love to you you know sometimes we think of that uh, speaking the truth in love that's when we have to go have the hard conversation right? We go, oh, well, we got to go speak the truth in love, which means I got to go straighten somebody out about their spirit. I have to go, and I have to make sure I do it in love so I'm not being judgmental. You know what? And it applies to that. I'm not saying it doesn't, <clears throat> but I'm saying if we limit it to that, we miss out on a lot because what Paul wants us to do is speak the truth in love, the Hebrew writer wants us to encourage and exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest anybody gets hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. The, the idea of communicating to each other who we are in Christ is so important because how many voices are out there telling you who you are and it's part of the deception? And it's, I mean, the, the, the deceiver is a calculating individual and he's good at it. So I'm going to speak the truth in love to you. <clears throat> in Jesus, you are chosen by God 
to a destiny that's predetermined by God. And that destiny is metamorphosis. That, def- that destiny is that you are changed by supernatural power into the image of Jesus Christ. That's, what, that's your destiny in Christ. That's who you are in Him. You're chosen by God. God has specifically chosen you to a destiny by virtue of the fact that you are in Christ. It's a transformation. You're blessed with every spiritual blessing that God has to give in Christ. And that's in His timing. Even where Paul, you know, in Romans, Paul said, we even rejoice in our trials. We even rejoice in our hardships because we know that God has a purpose for those hardships. When you can look at a hardship as a spiritual blessing from God, you're living in the reality. The deception will tell you that you don't deserve that. You're a victim. You're a victim of circumstances. You're a victim of whatever you're a victim of. You'll be told you're a victim. God said even your hardships are are God's grace. They're God's gracious gift, His spiritual grace being poured out on you. You're, You're blessed with every spiritual blessing. You're holy. Are you kidding me? You're holy and blameless before God. It doesn't feel like it, but that's the reality. That's the truth. We're holy because of Jesus being holy. We're holy because His standing with God is given to us as our standing because we're in Him. That's how much God loves us. And it's not a license. It's, a, it's the idea that we're, we're in something that God is doing that's, that's making us become full in our capacity to live with Him in relationship. And He's fitting us for everything that we were always created to be. He's he's the guy sitting next to us telling us who we are. You're a musician. You're here with a symphony orchestra. Some unfortunate thing has happened to you. You have a wife and kids back in this city here. We'll get you some help. We'll get your memory will come back. Don't worry. We're in that process of learning Jesus. We're learning who we really are. We're adopted. You're an adopted child into God's family which makes you an heir. You're an heir of God. Everything that Jesus inherits, you're a joint heir with Christ. So you're a joint heir with Jesus because you're in Him. That's, that's your standing. That's, who, that's the reality. You're purchased. God bought you with a price, as Mark alluded to at the end of our class this morning, is that God couldn't just ignore this and say, well... Yeah, you, you rebelled, you exchanged my reality for the lie, you, you, got, you got in this bondage to sin and death. I'm just going to kind of ignore that, wipe the slate clean, and, and give you that, you know, give you a do-over. <clears throat> he had to pay for that. That cost him. And he was willing to pay that price to purchase you. That's your value. You have, the world might tell you that you have no value. It might just be this cosmic accident, whatever the explanation is. God says, I purchased you. I chose you and I purchased you at the highest price so that I could do something with you. And what I'm doing with you is I'm restoring you to the fullness that you were always designed to have. We're lavished. Thanksgiving, I was, when I was thinking of lavished, I was thinking of Thanksgiving. You know, just the, the idea that, hey, we're lavished. It's, there's no, there's no, I mean, lavished is, it's a, a word that kind of just could be talked about. But it's, there's no shortage. There's no rations. There's no limitations. It's just like lavished. It's like it's overflowing. God's grace. We're sealed by His Spirit. We're, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit of God, as, and, and He's given us the Holy Spirit within us as, a, as a, a, a guarantee, so to speak. It's like when you, back in the day, when you put something on layaway, right? You couldn't take it home yet. You're still paying payments on it, but yet the initial payment guaranteed that it was yours or it, it excluded it from anybody else buying it. You had a claim to it. 
and then once it was paid off, you could, you could take it. In a sense, God is saying, by us having His Spirit, when we start looking around going, how long is it going to last? How bad is it going to get? How much do I endure? We go, you know what? The fact that God has given me His Spirit is a guarantee of his faithfulness that he who has begun a good work in you is going to complete it until the day of Jesus. It's a guarantee of what God is going to do with you. You're dead to sin and the bondage of sin, and you're alive in the resurrected life of Jesus. That's who you are. That's, that's how, what God's telling us. That's who we are in Christ, is we've been released from the bondage of sin. Sin no longer has dominion over us because Jesus broke that bondage. We're represented at the right hand of God. The head of our body is at the right hand of God. And that's, he is our representative. He's at the right hand of God. So when we're, when we're feeling it, when we're feeling the challenges of life, when we're feeling the discouragement and the uselessness that that. Satan wants to throw at us as this is who you are, you're worthless, this is who you are, you're weak, you're powerless, you're in bondage to sin, you're an addict, whatever he's telling us, Jesus is saying, you're exalted with me at, to the right hand of God in the heavenlies. That's where my body is, my body is with me. I'm the head, I'm at the right hand of God, my body is represented there fully. He, uh, we are, as the body of Christ, the fullness of him who fills all in all that's who jesus tells us that we are and we're a masterpiece <clears throat> no pressure but <clears throat> just understand <clears throat> that when when heaven whoever these principalities and powers in the heavenlies are i think there's some good ones and some some evil ones i think there's a lot of different entities out there that god doesn't tell us too much about but he does tell us in Ephesians chapter 3 that what he does is he holds the body of Christ up as an evidence of his eternal wisdom. And so when his enemies come against him and, and say maybe how punitive he is or how checkmated he is because of sin and stuff, God, what, the way that God answers that is he holds you up and shows heaven a picture of you and says, look at my Look at my servant. Look what I'm doing in my servant. Look at, look at my masterpiece. You're a masterpiece of God. And you go, man, I, I, you're in, in an earthen vessel. You're in an earthen vessel, so sometimes you don't feel like a masterpiece, but God tells us you are his masterpiece in Christ. You are restored to his image-bearing power and function that he gave to you that's who you are in jesus and that's just a sampling we just hit the highlights uh if you want to know more about who you are in christ delve into it get in the word and just be looking for who am i in christ let jesus fill you in on the details of who you are in him but you know as we bring this to a wrap there's people who are out there wandering. And the verse that Nate had up uh, during, the second verse that Nate had up during the uh, communion this morning is 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. And I know this is a, a Rick Caruso favorite also. Uh, <clears throat> and he says there, For the love of Christ compels us. Because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. There, there are people wandering. There are people in our lives that are wandering. Our, our kids and our grandkids, when they come into this world, they're prone to wandering. And God has placed them with us. God has placed each of you in a specific place to give them their identity, to show them who they really are so that they don't get too far along with the deception, to where they don't go searching for their identity out among the deception, but that they know from very young age who they are in Jesus. That's our job. 
And it, and it starts with our kids, right? It's in our grandkids and, and the, the, our immediate family who we can help them know who they are. That's our ministry. Just as if you saw some guy walking around kind of dazed and confused and said, hey, do you need some help? Can I help you? And he's like, I, I woke up and I don't know who I am. Can you get me to some place where they could maybe help me? Can, you, can we, you know, throw something out on social media and say, hey, does anybody recognize this guy? Let's help him find out who he is. That's our ministry as, as God's people is helping people know who they really are in Jesus. And to, to, to get them into a safe place, which is incidentally called the body of Christ where we can come in and we're all learning more about who we are. We're all, our, our spiritual amnesia is being restored as we live together and as we share Christ with each other and as we look at His Word together. We have ministry out there. We have people in our lives that are wandering and the love of Christ compels us. The love of Christ should move us to say, you know what, God, God, that's one of God's kids out there, and he's wandering around with amnesia, doesn't know who he is, and there's deceivers out there selling him a bill of goods, and, it, and it's destroying him or her. We need to get involved and share who they really are so that they could come in to the fullness of the Father of their spirit. So in the fall, not the season of the fall, but the gravitational spiritual fall of man, we exchanged the reality for the lie. But in our salvation, because of Jesus' sacrifice, we get to change that back. We get to exchange the lie. We get to, we get to bring the deception and say, I bought into this and I'm in bondage and, and, and this is hopeless. But we get to exchange that back for the reality. God will give us the reality back in exchange for the lie, because he was willing to pay the price for that. So I hope that we can approach life and ministry kind of with that concept, you know, that concept that we're helping people know who they really are. So that's, uh, that's what I have to say this morning. Now I know after I'm going to pray us out, and then uh, I know that uh, Dan wants to address the congregation after me, so just be seated after that. So I'm going to uh, lead a prayer to close out this part of it, and then we'll hear from, from Brother Dan. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the opportunity to gather together and begin a new week of kingdom service and to be just ministered to by your spirit that you dwell in each of us and that you're pouring out of each of us to touch and bless others. Father, help us to have a more clear understanding of who we are and what you're doing with us and to trust it and to go with it and to just be part of that that transformation uh, in the lives of others also as we extend the love of Christ to them in Jesus name amen